Well, happy Saturday, good evening, and a very warm welcome to the program on this 15th day of May. The news in detail. Setting us off tonight, President Paul Kagame has asked the new leadership of the Confederation of the African Football to raise the standard of the game to greater heights because it has the potential to transform the welfare of Africans. The Rwandan head of state made the statement on Saturday during the official opening of the CAF Executive Committee meeting alongside FIFA President Gianni Infantino and CAF President Dr. Patrice Motsepe here in Kigali. St. Norris starts us off tonight with this report. I want to thank all of you for the support and for the encouragement. This is the first time the new CAF Executive Committees meeting face to face and while addressing the gathering, Rwanda's President Paul Kagame pointed out that it is high time the question of why Africa has continued to lag behind in the sports world, specifically football, despite the continent's obvious talent, is answered. So it's a pleasure for me to, to have this opportunity, uh, this sort of turning point where there are new leaders, there are new mindsets, there are people, young and old who really have always been asking this question and trying to answer it when it comes to Africa. Africa, Africa, Africa endowed with so much, so many of us here, capable and should be, but why do we always lag behind on everything, including football or different kinds of sport. We have the talent, enormous talent, probably more and better than uh, you know it in the world. But we only excel, we do well, when we are elsewhere, not here. So FIFA President Gianni Infantino Thank pointed you. out that Thank Rwanda's so experiences much, uh, alone uh, are proof enough that Africa uh, has the potential to make football so history. Your personal uh, history, President, the history of this country, the way in which this country has become uh, an example not only for uh, East Africa, not only for Africa, but for the entire, entire world, shows us really that everything is possible. Everything is possible. We just need to want it, and then we need to do it. And this is what uh, you, President Karam, have been doing here and are doing in Africa. This is what we try, and I said this to our sisters and brothers and colleagues and friends here earlier this morning. This is what we all together want to do and try to do for Africa and African football. President Paul Kagame was also praised for his efforts towards African development in all realms, not excluding sports and football in particular. I've had the honor of over many, many years seeing you represent Africa, talk on behalf of us, uh, and make us proud in terms of the partnerships that we are building with the rest of the world, and also your commitment to football, your commitment to sports overall is something that inspires all of us. And we also say that in you, we, have a, we don't only have an ambassador, we've got a partner who talks on our behalf with all of the other presidents, with all of the other heads of states in Africa to say to them, we have to work together to support the most popular sport, of football, on the continent. During the meeting, former Arsenal FC head coach and current FIFA chief of global football development, Arsene Wenger, gave a presentation on how the game can be boosted and used as a catalyst of development in a broader sense. And this is what President Kagame used to encourage the new CAF Executive Committee to spur the change needed to make a difference. Can we change our mindsets? This is what I tell my people here in Rwanda, in the field uh, I'm responsible for, there's not a single day that passes without me telling my fellow countrymen and women that, one, we need to look up to ourselves and know that there are things we can do for ourselves and deliver on our improvement, on our development. 
There are others we cannot do. Maybe we are not, we don't have resources in place to do that, we don't have, but it doesn't mean that tomorrow we won't have those resources or we don't have that capability. So we build towards that. But the, the mindset has to change. All of us here in this room have got to start thinking of doing things differently. Thinking about the mission we have. The mission that goes beyond us as individuals, but serves the purpose of people who love football, or even those who don't love it, we want to make them love it. And the mission goes on. But knowing that also football is part and parcel of the politics of our development, the development of the continent. The participants in the meeting have been discussing important projects like a billion dollar initiative to build football infrastructure on the continent, the start of a continental competition at the high school level, capacity building among referees, the calendar of competitions starting next year to 2024, and more. Now let's also inform you that earlier today, Prime Minister Dr. Edward Njirene participated on behalf of His Excellency President Paul Kagame in the swearing-in ceremony of President Ismail Omar Gele of Djibouti. Djibouti's government on April 10th announced that President Ismail Omar Gele yet again won the election with a landslide with 98% of the 177,391 votes cast in the Horn of African nation, defeating his sole rival businessman and Zakaria Ismail Farah and earning him a fifth term in office. Also in the news today, today Rwanda paid tribute to the families that were completely wiped out during the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. The First Lady of Rwanda, Her Excellency Jeanette Kagame, has noted on the importance of keeping the memory of the families alive in Rwanda as a way of fighting genocide denial and negation. Ghislaine Mugwaneza has more. The ceremony to remember the families took place at the Nyanza Genocide Memorial Site, where a flame of hope was lit and flowers were laid on the graves of the genocide victims buried there. The Rwandan Graduate Genocide Survivors Organization, GIRG, that organized the ceremony announced that their effort to identify families that were completely wiped out during the genocide against the Tutsi have so far uncovered a total of 15,593. Genocide survivors point out the importance of remembering the families. Remembering them is giving them value. Another thing is that those who deny the genocide see what they did. Yes, they did it, but we survived, and the country survived too. The country does not support what they did, and we are still fighting those that keep bringing that history back. And think of it. GIRG President Ejid Gatari has reiterated that survivors should strive to prevent that history from repeating itself. The children we used to see when the genocide ended, they are adults now. We're ready to serve the country, ready to build Rwanda, as well as building the world with no genocide. And that is the main goal of GRG. It's our vision that grief and injustice was passed through there is nothing that can erase all that except serving well the country and understand that where we lost our parents, we gained the country. As President Pokagame once told us, we listened to his messages several times and they really touch our hearts. The Minister of Justice, who is also the Attorney General Johnson Rusinje, has urged everyone to understand the value of remembering these families. When we hold this ceremony, we are representing the families that were wept out, and I believe that they know this and that they can see us where they are now. We should always represent them and think of what they wished for, their dreams, what they left behind. We tell ourselves a lot of things and go beyond what they thought of by doing it because it is the only way to give them back the value they deserve and the only way to keep their memory alive.
because people survived. Via her Twitter handle, the First Lady of Rwanda, High Excellency Jeanette Kagame, posted, Today, we remember the lives of the families that were completely wiped out during the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, men, women, and children that were denied a chance at life and a future. Let the memories of these families ignite in us the fire to collectively fight against genocide denial and revisionism as we continue our nation's journey towards healing and reconciliation. This is the 13th time since GIRG organized this ceremony which was held under the theme They will not be forgotten because we survived. Karangi district has the largest number of the families that were completely wiped out during the genocide against the Tutsi at 2,839. Shislen Mugwaneza, reporting for ITV. May their souls continue resting in peace. Now, moving on, Kigali residents, Kigali city residents, applaud the established system through which they get information related to land services through radios as it clears the confusion and discourages those who used to trick them for money so that they can help them get land-related services. Sam Kalisa has more. Related services are some of the most sought after by many citizens across the country. As of the recent, in accordance with the COVID-19 prevention guidelines, programs including community assemblies, land service week, and others have been stopped. Kigali City residents have been provided with access to information through radios and televisions, where they express their own views on the proposed improvements in the land service sector. Elise Habimana, a resident of Wumbogo sector, is one of many others who gave their ideas through radio. My idea was that if a person go to seek a certain service, let there be a time frame for getting that service. Because whenever there is no clear time frame, services are delayed. The delay could sometimes cause people to use the money they intended to use for construction in other ways. Many of the community complaints are related to delays in obtaining construction permits which are normally obtained in not more than 20 days. Land transfer delays, sellers who deliberately delay land transfer documents, the cost required from people who receive land donations or inheritance, building repair permits and more. Many of the people do not have enough information about such services and others are mislaid. As explained by Frederico Uambaye, a resident of Gisozi sector, they suggest that this program of information access should be continued. They told me to apply for the permit at the district level and that the permit would be available in 10 days. The program should be continued because it benefits many people. Gasabo District Executive Administrator Umwali Polin says the COVID-19 pandemic has hindered service delivery, but especially land-related services, as it is still difficult to meet the community physically. However, the new information access system will establish means to solve issues in the land service sector. The Kigali City Master Plan shows what's meant for every area, and that is what we are telling residents now so that they know what the Master Plan says on activities to be carried out in their land areas. Sometimes an area is designated for industrial construction, but citizens are misled by land sellers for their own benefits. Then citizens construct what's not permitted, and we destroy it, which makes them not to be free to their administration. The initiative, named Smart in Ekozabaturaje, according to Muhirwa Marie Solange, an architect and chief urban planner of the city of Kigali, is of a great benefit as it will enable more than 4,000 pending land document requests to be completed in a short period of time. We appealed to land service providers in other districts to help us. We are working on those pending documents. 
and we believe they will have been finished by the end of May, be it for those who need land transfer documents or even registering their land. A joint service has been set up for residents in the city of Kigali who apply for construction permits where the applicant will be provided with both water and electricity permits and a permit that proves that the land for construction is environmental friendly. Before all these documents were requested from different institutions. Sam Kalisa, RTV News. Thank you, Sam Kalisa, for that report. Local residents and psychologists in Moko sector in Jichumbi district say that it is possible for the residents to find solutions to their own problems that hinder the Rwandan community's development. This was mentioned during the celebration of the International Day of Families, which was held on a national level in Moko sector. Boniface Rejea and Clemence Nakure say that they used to live a bad life until they became beneficiaries of Vision Umoenje program that aims at eradicating poverty, but they did not benefit from this because of their mismanagement. I were very poor. I used to get money and spend it on useless things. I didn't have information about development. I used to drink too much of alcohol and buy maybe one cloth, nothing else. I used to spend the money on food and rent, and I was seeing that my life was very bad. These two beneficiaries testify that after getting assistance from Muko sector officials through providing guidance for them, they achieved a lot. Muko sector officials have said that this program that they named Baptism helped them in uniting families that had conflicts. We have them. As you know that the categories are being reformed, even though the figures are not yet out. But as we see, many people who used to be in first category are no longer found in it. Because they really worked. When you visit their homes, you realize that they really worked. You find that one has taken a good care of the cow given to him or her, and he sells matoke, and you can see it gives good results. Due to the analysis, 75 out of 174 people have shifted from first to second category. On the national level, the International Day of Families was celebrated in Mukose. The Minister of Gender and Family Promotion, Jeanette Waisenge, has asked the residents to find solutions to their problems as it would help them to achieve the goal of owning a safe family. Family is the natural foundation of the Rwandan community, is the foundation of the country. It's true there are so many challenges that the family faces nowadays. There is conflicts, raping young children, and other many different things. But there are other families that we can take as an example. For example, those guiders in baptism program, we can take a good example from them, which means that even if they are families that have got conflicts, good families are possible and there are many. Let us all strive to build that family with everyone's participation. During the ceremony, the Rwanda's Ministry of Gender and Family Promotion appreciate the achievements in this sector of assisting and teach people in first of their category on how to manage well the financial support given to them. To health matters now, cardiologists and nutritionists say it is important to control the amount of salt in our diet as it continues to be the root cause of high blood pressure which also causes stroke. Across the city, various people and restaurant owners say they are careful when it comes to the amount of salt they put in their food. I eat as little salt as possible. When there's a lot of salt in the food, I'm unable to eat it. I've heard that if you eat a lot of salt, it increases your blood pressure. I don't eat raw salt, neither do I eat plenty of salt. We were told to eat little salt at home, and I'm trying to enforce the same thing at my home. When I'm going to cook, I use the least amount possible. The World Health Organization says the amount of salt a person consumes per day should not exceed 5 grams. Nonetheless, a new report from the organization shows that most people eat between 9 and 12 grams per day. 
Lea Msfiteyezu, a nutritionist, says that salt, whether in natural foods, mined or extracted from the sea, is important for the human body but requires moderation. Salt contains two minerals, which are sodium and chloride. Sodium is the most important as it helps with water retention in the body. If it becomes a lot or insufficient, there's an imbalance. It takes about two weeks for one to get used to little salt intake. It's hard at first, but you get used. <laughs> Professor Joseph Muchumbitsi, a cardiologist, says that high salt intake is the root cause of high blood pressure and stroke. 90% of the blood is made up of water and salt. So when you consume lots of salt, it produces more water, which increases one's blood pressure. The challenge is that most people live with blood pressure without knowing it, and it can be fatal, leading to intracranial hemorrhage and strokes. And once they get to this, usually it will be hard to function as they used to. Professor Muchumbisi also says that in addition to heart diseases, high salt intake causes other diseases. High salt intake can cause kidney stones, stomach cancer, ear infections, among other diseases. And the risk of acquiring them could increase because of the increased salt intake. Statistics from the Ministry of Health show that 15.9% of adults in Rwanda suffer from high blood pressure. The number of heart disease patients monitored across hospitals between 2018 and 2020 has risen from 25,353 to 88,486. The Ministry of Health also indicates that chronic diseases including high blood pressure and accidents account for 59% of all deaths in Rwanda. According to the World Health Organization, by 2025, the global salt intake should be reduced by 30%. And reducing salt intake would prevent 2.5 million deaths annually. Gloria Mutisi, reporting for RTV News. Well, that's all we had for you tonight. Thank you for the privilege of your time. Have a wonderful weekend as you continue to do your role in stopping the spread of the pandemic. Enjoy the rest of the programming. God bless you and keep you. And until next time, I'm Gloria Mutisi. Bye for now.